This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thanks for coming. So a lot of you guys know me. Uh, I'm Dan Buckley. So I am new to this program uh, just since January uh, as the DGS and, and very much Marvin and Tara are the sort of heart and soul of the program. And certainly we couldn't be here without everything they've been doing. So uh, I've been learning a lot about this program from them and from you over the last few months. And you know, this symposium, one of the reasons we're here is to sort of learn more about what you're doing. Um, and it's also a recognition of what you've accomplished. So we're gonna have a graduation ceremony uh, in a couple of days. Uh, and that's a chance for you to sort of be honored, but this is a chance for you to sort of tell us a little bit about what you have been doing uh, and just to share that and to recognize that. Um, what I would say that I've learned so far about this program uh, it's remarkable in a few ways in that it's super diverse. Um, I mean, the School of Integrative Plant Sciences is amazingly diverse. We have 80 faculty who just, I mean, yeah, we study plants, but we study microbes interacting with plants. We study soils. We're out in the field. We're in the lab. We're doing molecular biology. Like, we are incredibly diverse. And so the students in this program represent that diversity. We have more than 50 advisors that are in our program now and people are joining all the time. And you all have worked with a wide cross section of the faculty within SIPS, you know, your own primary advisors as well as other faculty you've interacted with. So the program is super diverse. And so that's one reason I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have to say because I think I'm gonna learn a lot about the kind of stuff we do here. The other thing I'd say is that I've learned the students are like super ambitious and highly motivated. Like I talk to faculty in different units, uh, you know, how are you doing with the MPS students? How do you find them in the classes? And I only ever hear great things. You know, they're super motivated, they're organized, they know what they wanna do. Like they just have great things to say about you all. And so that's another reason why I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to present because I think you know, this is just fantastic stuff and I wanna hear what you guys have been working on. The other thing that I think is remarkable about this program, other than our students and our diversity, is um, it's hard, right? I mean, you guys have a lot of graduate level coursework to cram in the two semesters, and it's a struggle to get all that stuff done. And then you have the capstone project. And our undergrads just had a symposium last week. I mean, they get years to figure out what they're doing, right? Our, our MS and PhD students, I mean, they're here for years to figure this stuff out. You guys have a year. And many of you have finished in two semesters, right? That's remarkable. And I think the most remarkable thing about it isn't necessarily the work that you've done on the capstone project. It's just getting started. It's identifying the problem. So one of the things when you're an undergrad, your faculty give you uh, the questions and you give them answers, right? You take a test, here are the questions, here are the answers, boom. It's hard to provide an answer to a question way harder to come up with the question itself. And that's what the capstone project makes you do. It makes you, throws you in, in the fall, like come up with a capstone project, go. And you guys freaked out, right? You're like, what am I gonna do with my capstone project? And you start talking to faculty, you talk to each other, and it's a bit of a crisis. And part of it is that that's what the real world is like. You know, the real world isn't just here's a question, give me the answer. I mean, sometimes it is. But when you get to the level that you guys are at now, we expect you to be able to lead. And that means defining the questions. You know, what are the questions worth asking? What are the questions we need to invest in? That's hard stuff. And I think you guys have figured that out. And so what we're doing today with these lightning talks isn't like, here's this big manifesto. Here's this big dissertation. It's really, here's my question. This is a question that I found worthwhile that I'm investing in, maybe I've already started to answer it, maybe I'm gonna answer it this summer. Um, we're not as much interested in the answer. We wanna know what's your question and why do you think it's important? And that's why I think these lightning talks are really exciting and, and fun, and I'm looking forward to what you guys have to say. But so Catherine, I'm gonna go ahead and yield the floor to you if you wanna get started, and I'm just gonna leave this here in case you need it. Okay, great, thank you, Dan. And thank you, Tara, for organizing all of this. I miss you all a lot. I wish I was in the room. So thanks for accommodating me here on Zoom. 
And I'd like to first and foremost thank my advisor for all of his support throughout my capstone development. And I'm excited to present a really short summary today. So uh, my project is titled, How Can Voluntary Carbon Markets Work for Small Farmers? And I'll just quickly explain voluntary carbon markets. I'll refer to them as VCM, essentially are the voluntary buying and selling of carbon offsets. And carbon offsets essentially represent an amount of avoided or reduced emissions. So in this first slide, I'll just talk about what I did. And the second slide, I'll describe some potential solutions to this question. So my goal was really to explore how can these programs better serve small farmers. And small farmers essentially face high barriers to entry to participate in VCM, yet represent approximately 52% of the US in farmland, in acres. So their sequestration potential should not be ignored. And the first three objectives I set out to answer this question were first just to explain the context in which these markets are growing. Secondly, I was curious in if I could quantify the rise of agriculture's participation in VCM. And an point, important point here, excuse me, is really answering the question, why is offsetting contentious? So happy to talk more offline about that. But the crux of the capstone was really this third objective here, where I was investigating these barriers to entries, entry and credibility concerns due to issues of effectively measuring credits and equity of the market participants. So that's just to lay out the context and we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So, you know, the heart of the capstone is, you know, answering a question, answering a question with some solutions. So here's my effort in trying to pose a a solution to how can these programs better serve small farmers. And I've ultimately concluded these, uh, a solution would stem from three pillars of change. So firstly is behavioral, and I would urge VCM to implement a bottom-up approach for farmers instead of a top-down approach conventional in the market. And I secondly decided regionalizing programs would also better serve small producers. And for that, I conducted a spatial analysis in GIS. Would be happy to share that at a later time. But essentially, I wanted to identify US counties with high sequestration potential. And thirdly, is a technological investment to help lower those fixed um, costs that are very hard to overcome to participate in the market and have a local implementation solution paired to help people actually implement uh, technology versus sort of dropping it and walking it away. Um, so that's very, very brief summary and I try to keep it at three minutes. I think I'm a little over, but thank you so much. I'm glad I'm able to just share a highlight of the presentation today. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul, and uh, my advisors were Don Rafael and Sonia, and uh, Sonia Skelly and Dr. Mark Bridgen. And uh, sorry, Dr. Don Rafael, Dr. Sonia. And, uh, yeah, so uh, my uh, capstone project is on Talia Alliance breeding, uh, Talia Alliance orchids for Singapore in the tropical lowlands. And uh, my capstone was creating a review and breeding resource for this group of orchids. So Calia were once synonymous with orchids and grown uh, widely as cut flowers and as corsage flowers in the United States. Although the majority of breeding is now mainly in Taiwan and Japan. And um, yeah, so they're once synonymous with uh, orchids, but they've lost a lot of their market share to other forms of orchids. And you can only really see them at uh, specialist shows and uh, hobbyist conventions. And they're just like stunning and beautiful there. You know, they can get up to like eight. Some, some of them are even 10 or 11 inches across. And, but the only problem is that most of them only last for about two weeks and the rest of the time, the commercial hobbyist, the commercial grower is growing them for like the rest of the year. So it kind of has a very low flowering yield and long generation time. So these are some of the, the issues as well. In, um, in, Sing in the tropics in particular and in Singapore, there are only 101 registered Kelia hybrids as opposed to 3,217 hybrids of all other orchid genera. And 
worldwide, worldwide um, they comprise only 10% of new registrations and it's been stagnant over the past few decades. In addition, there's a lot of inappropriate selection of plants for the tropics as uh, quite a lot of the relatives which were bred for the cut flower trade in the US uh, actually come from more temperate regions and higher elevations, whereas there are actually quite a lot of species which are adapted to the tropical lowlands. But because the initial uh, very complex breeding was done with these relatives which are uh, not too adapted to the lowlands, there's this bias that the plants like don't work, work, really work in tropical areas. And the information about this genus is spread over a variety of literature of varying rigor. So my aim was, of course, to compile all of this and have a resource for people and gardens in the tropics. So in terms of my methodology, I compiled records um, in various like media and literature about a Kelly Alliance that demonstrated sustained growth and flowering in Singapore. And I came up with a heuristic uh, to help identify like which, what are some uh, relatives and progenitors in hybrid backgrounds which enable them to do this. Uh, of all the members I've identified, I searched the literature for what characteristics they impart to their progeny because there's not been a lot of very like, uh, compared to what we do with say like wheat or other ornamental crops, they don't really have very clear like genetic paper, like mark, uh, papers which do with the markers and other areas of the genome. So it's, it's a lot of very like observational uh, things based on phenotype. And um, I compared the strategies in the Catlia Alliance breeding to what has been done with other uh, groups of orchid in Singapore. And turns out there are actually like a lot of parallels with these strategies. And um, I outlined several goals, um, species and hybrids, which a person might want to use if they want to achieve certain goals in breeding these plants. And lastly, I'm uh, including a chapter about supplementary horticultural techniques such as virus control and um, growing under LED lights in order to provide a centralized resource for this as well. So in terms of results, um, like part of the limitation for flowering of Catlia in the tropics appears to be some relationship with, uh, with day length sensitivity and requiring a temperature drop, although there's not really like very clear studies on it. Like there's some papers which suggest that a certain species can be long day and others which suggest it's short day and Overall, like it is probably some sort of like source sink balance, like it is for a majority of plants, and um, as well as uh, some selection pressure in cultivation. And um, I identified the different species and hybrids for targeted color combinations and patterns. And the interesting thing is that you can use like different like species which can look completely different to accomplish what looks like almost in exactly the same hybrids, but this would also imply that even though you are getting the same goal, there are actually different uh, parameters for how you can best cultivate and grow them. So I suggested some combinations if you would like to grow in a more um, equatorial, equatorial and tropical climate. And a lot, another issue is that a lot of the trendy breeding plants for the hobbyist market, which are more compact and smaller, are actually not very well adapted to the tropics. So this is again a reoccurring issue. And I uh, propose some suggestions to doing so. And of course, there are some difficulties as well because some, there are some species for desired color, like, colors like uh, miniature red or pure white or white with a colored lip, which just don't really do well in the tropics. So there's some other suggestions for that. And, um, I, and I'm also reviewing like the other supplemental for the cultural techniques, as I mentioned. And finally, with regards to advice for my project, I'm really looking for people who can give me advice on uh, web scraping because it will help me like deal a lot with the larger data set. So thank you, that's all. Hi, uh, I'm Robin. My advisor was David Rosader, uh, and this is my capstone. Uh, so I was hoping to develop an interactive map of US natural disasters using um, open source tools. So the goal of this was for just for me to kind of learn the tools and software and how to and just be able to uh, show that I can um, use these to develop a sort of interactive user interface in order to display and interact with um, data and information. Uh, so I used R through R Studio and I also used R packages, including uh, Shiny, Leaflet, uh, Diffler, um, and Tidyverse in order to do this. Uh, I got my data from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the US Census Bureau. Uh, so what I ended up creating was um, this uh, interactive uh, map 
interface where you can select the date range and the um, type of disaster, and it'll just um, adjust the output of the map based on the parameters um, and create like sort of a by county um, points uh, based on the uh, sizing, based on the number of total like disasters within the uh, date range selected. Uh, so uh, yeah, that was basically it. <laughs> I managed to uh, show that I could um, use these tools and uh, I hope to further develop this sometime. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Luka Malejevic. I'm from Serbia. Uh, and today I'll be talking about my Capstan project, which is on the topic of um, actual manual for canola growers for efficient crop protection and management and the future potentials for canola growth and the market growth of canola as a crop in Serbia. Uh, my academic advisor is uh, Dr. Antonio Di Tommaso. So basically why I've chosen this project is because my uh, background, academic background was uh, also in plant protection, but I've never had quite the opportunity to explore um, canola as a crop or rather any crop in that sense through the whole growth stage and its management and crop protection background. So uh, this project will actually focus on the integration of the cultivation of canola of like soil preparation, weeds, pathogens, how to manage them, how to manage pests and to maximize yield and productivity. Uh, and then the second part is actually the question that I want to answer. That's what's the future potential of economic growth of um, canola within the market of Serbia? Because where I come from, this crop has just started becoming more popular in like uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, after the 2008 market crash, uh, the prices have stabilized. Uh, the crop has become more stable and uh, the potentials for its growth has um, uh, risen dramatically. Um, and then going through the segments, uh, I will be covering like canola as an oil crop, uh, its importance as uh, it's the third most important oil crop in the world after uh, palm oil and uh, soybean oil, and then canola production cultivation on a global level, uh, the main pathogens in their management, uh, insects in the management, uh, the weeds aspect and the management of weeds. Uh, on the side, I've also done a little small project uh, in the weeds management in the critical period of weed management in canola as a crop, uh, and have found that the main uh, time when to tackle the weeds is between the fourth and the sixth leaf of canola. Uh, also tackling the optimal fertilization practices, uh, and then introducing a little bit of the history of canola growth in Serbia and why it's important as a crop and then answering the question of the future economic canola uh, market potential. And if it's going to rise in the acreage uh, in the future and whether uh, it's better to explore the markets of oil or biofuels, that would be all. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Jonah Goldstein. Uh, very thankful to my advisors, Dr. Don Raykow and Dr. Sonia Skelly. Um, as well as the rest of my cohort in public garden leadership uh, and SIFs. So my project is on potential collaboration between community schools and public gardens. Uh, if community schools are an unfamiliar term to you, you're not alone. That's a big reason why I'm doing this project. So what's the issue that I'm tackling? Schools have varying degrees of opportunity for students to engage in experiential learning, particularly nature-based learning. Uh, you know, largely the opportunities you have at a school are determined by the zip code, right? By the tax base, how much funding that school gets. The U.S. is an absolute nightmare of economic disparity, uh, and it's getting worse by the day. Uh, and many schools in America, unfortunately, look like this. Uh, some also look like this. I thought this was a prison. <laughs> it's a school. Uh, and that, unfortunately, leads to some of this. So how can we tackle this? Public gardens are perfectly positioned to help expand green programming at schools. Um, public gardens are institutions that are rooted in place that, that are, you know, they're geographically based. They have a large uh, staff, large educational programming potential um, and amazing resources when it comes to plants. Um, so I've been talking to public gardens that have uh, education programs that other gardens could potentially model. This is work that 
Don has done a lot of in terms of looking at these kinds of programs. Um, I'm looking specifically at school collaboration. So Naples Botanic Garden uh, in Florida, they have a program called Dirt Made My Lunch. It's where kids work with edible plants. Um, they learn about where their food's coming from. They get to take home a tomato seedling. They also have a program called Collier Greens that's a Teach the Teachers program. Um, so they're training teachers to do garden-based programming at their school, training teachers also to establish community gardens um, just to expand their impact, essentially. Denver Botanic Gardens also has some very innovative programming in this respect. Uh, they have this really ambitious program called Growing Scientists. It's a collaboration um, with a number of cultural institutions in the area, uh, all working together to apply jointly for grant funding um, in order to carry out some pretty ambitious educational programming that takes place at each institution. Uh, Cornell Botanic Gardens also has some school programs. Um, Haudenosaunee Food Crops, right, a rare acknowledgement of our stolen land, um, as well as Plants Have Families, um, which is uh, about the uh, genetic lineage of plants and how all of that works. Um, so what are community schools? Community schools are schools that have adopted a community school model, essentially strengthening their resources, their available programming, and opportunities for students by an extensive network of partnerships, organizational partnerships, often with nonprofits. Um, so community schools have infrastructure to support collaborative programming, and that's what makes them so important to public gardens, because public gardens, it takes a lot of resources from them to run a program with the school. Some really large institutions, this isn't too much of a problem like Brooklyn Botanic Garden, you know, they, they're very, very well established. Um, they can dedicate a lot of resources to transportation, to outreach, to forming those relationships. But smaller or newer gardens don't have that. And so when they need to be more strategic about how to form their programming, they can look to community schools. Community schools have dedicated site coordinators. That's a point person who will interface with different organizations. They're often sort of leading the charge when it comes to outreach for partnerships. Um, they have goal-oriented community engagement teams. So I worked at a community school in Rochester that had what was called CETs, community engagement teams, that were each dedicated to a different focus. So as uh, the person focusing on green initiatives, as part of the health and wellness community engagement team. They have robust community outreach um, and family relationships that are built on trust, often um, the partners that community schools will make will also provide important services, you know, for things like housing and food security. And so community schools are able to do what's called a warm handoff, where that organization will inherit the trust with the families and students that this school has established. Uh, they'll have extended learning time that was present at the school that I um, was based at in Rochester. Um, so time after classes wrap up specifically dedicated to things like project-based or experiential learning. Um, and there it is, that emphasis. And they also have me, um, or at least some of them do. Uh, which is definitely an asset. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hello, my name is Kylie Bronius. OK, uh, so I did my project on the optimization of habitat infrastructure sites for connectivity of Puma Conkolar habitat in California. Uh, my advisor was Diana Sinton. She was very helpful throughout this. And so was David Rossiter. So the motivations behind this project, um, there has been very low genetic diversity observed in specifically the Santa Monica mountain range in Southern California. Um, a lot of mountain lion populations have been isolated by major freeways. And um, that's limiting the mating opportunities for these populations. So while there are some land areas that are big enough, um, they're, they're not really sustainable for a population to thrive and reproduce because it's causing a lot of inbreeding and then population decline. Um, there was a study done in which a lot of pumas were tagged with GPS collars and one male from that study was able to cross freeway 101 in 2009 and initiate what was referred to as a genetic rescue event uh, by mating with several females on the other side. So that was just served as evidence that um, these freeways are majorly inhibiting those populations. And if mountain lions are able to cross, that can be um, really beneficial to helping them not become endangered in those areas. Uh, mountain lions are very evasive of humans and they need highly rocky slopes and a lot of vegetative cover. There was one researcher involved in this study who um, uh, he was quoted in saying that um, I have a GPS, the mountain lion has a collar. I know he's 15 meters in front of me, but I never ever see them which I thought was kind of cool. 
Um, and then recent bills provide funding for habitat infrastructure, such as land bridges, um, to cross these major freeways. So this project was intended to kind of decide how to allocate some of that funding. So I was able to create um, eight variations of a habitat suitability model in California using ArcGIS Pro and data sourced from ESRI, um, the National Hydrography Dataset, USGS, and a few other sources. Um, I chose two region of interest. One was Northern Central California. You can see kind of based on these studies, um, that red region in the middle is like the Central Valley where there's a lot of cropland, not a lot of sustainable habitat. And then uh, that Eastern region is more forested. And then in Southern California, that's more the Santa Monica region and like LA with a lot of those major freeways interrupting. Um, and I was able to, once I created these models, uh, take them into R and do some programming to get some um, some metrics on the connectivity of patches and the adjacency of certain rated pixels. These are rated on a scale of one to five um, once they were put into R. Um, so yeah, I was able to identify patches and um, get some statistics on their connectivity. And then from that, I was able to create these two um, site optimization maps. Um, these were pretty robust, but based on those suitability models, uh, the highest suitability patches that were ranked um, number five. I was able to just define the major points of intersection between these major freeways and those high suitability habitats so that um, this is kind of a preliminary map. You can see some of the clustering of where would be the best locations to build those habitat infrastructure across freeways. So yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Deborah. I'm Soil and Crop Sciences Concentration and my advisor is Dominic Wolf. Um, really love hearing what you're all working on, by the way. Um, the title of my capstone is an assessment of soil health research in global cotton cropping systems under a changing climate. So why cotton, you might be thinking. Um, it's a really, really important cash crop and source of income for millions of farmers worldwide. It's the most important fiber crop uh, most used natural fiber in the fashion and textile industry, where I worked for five years before coming here. A few, few key facts. It's a $40 billion industry, 25 million tons of lint, um, which is after the seeds have been removed from the fiber, is produced per annum. It's grown in 80 countries on a huge variety of different soil types and climatic conditions, and it touches the lives of 100 million different farmers. And in terms of the cotton production today, Less than 1% is grown organically. It's actually 0.94%. Um, that's been growing since the 1990s steadily, but obviously very slowly. And 25% is grown according to sustainable standards. And all of these logos represent a different sustainable standard. A third of these are organic. And the others you know, really look to reduce the environmental impacts of cotton through more efficient use of resources, but they're nowhere near as prohibitive as organic. Um, and a lot of them are starting to put soil health more at the center. So they're kind of being revised as we speak. But that means that that 74% of cotton is being grown conventionally. And there are a lot of concerns around how poor management practices have been really maximizing yields, but at the expense of soil health and human health, and ecological health. Um, so the challenge is that cotton production is projected to grow by 1.5% per annum until 2030. Um, but in a lot of these systems, there's degraded and depleted soils, and there have been stagnant global yields um, since 2007. And so the opportunity, on the other hand, is that the fashion industry is really excited about soil health and the role that soil carbon stocks can play in climate change mitigation, um, which is kind of why I came here to look at really how to tap into the 74% um, and increase adoption of soil conservation practices. And so the goal of my capstone is to drive evidence-based approaches to land management and policy to improve soil quality and productivity in cotton-based systems. And I intend to do this by reviewing and synthesizing all the conservation agriculture research that's looking at cotton-based systems and identifying gaps in those research. So in terms of outputs, I'll be producing a soil health um, cotton database and then mapping that to assess the spatial distribution and concentration of that research against cotton production distribution to identify those gaps. And then my report will be 
um, discussing the implications for the fashion industry, specifically looking at how to best tailor conservation practices according to cropping system, soil type, and agroclimatic zone. Um, but if you have any suggestions or have done any research with cotton or know of anyone, I'd love to talk to you because I know it's not really a crop that's looked that much at Cornell. Um, but yeah, love to chat. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Yun, and my capsule paper is topic is comparison of two agriculture system in Hubei province in China and New York State in United States. And my advisor is Peter Hobbs, and my specialty is in soil and crop science. And um, giving a little bit background on why I'm doing this because after I finish this program, I will be going back to China and start a farm. So. Uh, hopefully, after like dive, diving more into the capstone paper, I will have a, a more general idea of how like actually starting from. And uh, there are more some interesting I'm, I'm focusing some is like uh, China and the U.S. is kind of the two biggest import and exporter countries. And where I, what I have learned so far, like uh, United States definitely has more like efficient maximum yield on each crop of land, like using less labor force and using more mechanical machines. But in other terms, that all contribute to many like nation policies and the government or towards that. So my main objective is to compare the similarity and differences in the agriculture in Xiangyang city, which is the city I will working on when I'm going back and the Tompkins County, which we all live here right now. It's like, like where I'm more familiar with and easy to get data to compare. And, and the second is to understand how you, unique the agriculture system have arisen in these two slightly locations, uh, which like, um, oh, sorry, yeah. And any management suggestions can be made that's what I trying to main focus about because like uh, we also facing the like popula population increasing issues like in 2015 and we like these two countries meaning like feeding contributing feeding a lot of uh, people in other countries so which I am more concerned about how to like what we can learn from each other and maximum the yield and contribute to like feeding the the human. Yeah. So uh, what I have mean, like the methodology of my program is like meaning focus on like literature review and the library research and get, getting data from the government website and compare them. And those are the main topics I have developed that will be focusing on talking. One is farmland. This is more towards to nature habitat is like to topography, climate, and soil characteristic. And this is gonna be more towards to the crop, like why this nation gonna, what type of crop and what type of farm they are gonna have. And the next is the um, management side wise is more towards to human management is like farm size and type and mechanical use and the controlling method of pests and weed. And this is gonna, or, or towards to the, like what we have in the in the nature side, because what I have, and then the next is focus on marketing and how where to sell and the storage, and what gonna effects of the price and what's the component of profit in both two countries, and the next is really important. I think it's one of the thing we have to consider about is the government policy, because like. Uh, what's uh, what's the biggest impact on the two agriculture system? I feel like other than the nature wise, the government things like Chinese like the land are owned by the government. Like once, because what I have learned in Cornell, I have known that soil sustainability and soil health is a great, really important component. But once I have talked to my dad about uh, what are we gonna going to have a farm, like we're gonna mainly focus on the soil health. But like what's really sad, like I heard from my dad is like, we don't have to focus about that because we, we don't own the land. Like we don't know, like after 10 years where this piece of land is gonna going to be and 
so that makes me feel really sad and really want to work on it in the future. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for listening and thanks, Peter. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Wyatt Boone. Uh, it's a bit wordy, but basically, I'm looking at uh, dual process anaerobic and aerobic digestion of fish manure for hydroponic fertilizer. So, um, this basically all is aquaponics. Uh, so, I wasn't always into farming. Uh, I used to work in government. That's where I graduated with my under degree or undergrad degree, but um, I hated it and I wanted it, but I was interested in sustainability. So I, and I lived in cities like most of my life or very close to cities. So I looked at aquaponics because this is, and hydroponics, because aquaponics is probably one of the most sustainable systems you can have in a city and having probably about the only kind of livestock you can have in a city. Um, so I wasn't really sure who would be here today. So hopefully this isn't too basic, but basically aquaponics, um, you're, most of the time you are using the water that the fish live in. Uh, to grow plants. Uh, but first we have to put these, this water through a filtration. Uh, so the liquid waste, which is usually produced by the gills and the urine of the fish, uh, gets processed through a biofilter. And this gets normally recirculated around even in a general uh, aquaculture system. Uh, but the solid waste has to be collected as well. So that's your manure. If you let that accumulate and build up, uh, ammonia toxicity will happen. You also gunk up your system and it's no good. Um, but a lot of times, uh, aquaculturalists and even aquaponic producers will take this solid waste and just flush it down the toilet, which is a waste. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a real waste because you're spending a lot of money on fish food and this food becomes poop. And well, there's a lot of nutrients that we can take out of this poop. Um, so my experiment is specifically focusing on the three different ways of microbially processing this waste into usable hydroponic fertilizer. Uh, so I've gone ahead and made three different bacterial digestion chambers. So first we have an anaerobic tank, uh, an aerobic tank, and then an anaerobic tank. So it gets processed for the full four weeks and then moved to the aerobic tank where it gets another process for another four weeks. Um, so each of these tanks have unique set of microorganisms that will uh, digest their solid waste. Uh, oh yeah, and they're all heterotrophic, so they're taking this organic waste and basically turning it into a usable inorganic mineral nutrient uh, for hydroponic fertilizer. Um, now this is really important uh, for a lot of different reasons. So we can stop a lot of nutrient leaching from going into waterways by just, you know, by dumping that, that excess waste. Like we don't really want to be doing that. And by turning into a usable product, like we're contributing to the circular economy. Um, also just for aquaponic producers, uh, a lot of times just by using the fish water, they will have uh, nutrient deficiencies, um, specifically in potassium, iron, calcium, sometimes phosphorus and ma uh, magnesium. So by taking the waste and processing it through one of these and adding it back into your system, they can uh, fix some deficiencies within their system. Hopefully, that's the hope. Um, and then uh, just in general, they can spend less money on fish feed because you're getting more nutrients out of the same amount of feed that you are using. Uh, and lastly, if, if uh, hopefully this, this process, the, the combined one, can produce a good enough uh, hydroponic nutrient uh, or just straight up organic hydroponic producers, so people who aren't even growing fish themselves can buy fish waste, process it themselves, and then use it in their own hydroponic systems. So it'd be kind of like akin to like an organic farmer buying chicken manure, putting it on their field and growing their crops next season. But instead we're buying fish waste, putting it in barrels and then growing it hydroponically. Uh, so next up, that's weird. Um, I've, been, I've been tracking the nutrient makeup of all of my bacterial tanks and I have some preliminary results outside, that we'll take a look at later. Uh, and I'm testing each, each uh, nutrient. So we have one of four in here and another one of four in here uh, against each other and against a conventional hydroponic fertilizer to see which one does best. So fingers crossed that it works out. But uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions or discuss my research outside of my project or my poster. Thank you. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, my capstone project, well, first of all, I'm in public garden leadership. 
Um, and my advisors are uh, Don Rakow and Sonia Skelly. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm looking at how um, public gardens can adopt seed sharing programs. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what seed sharing programs are and then how they intersect with public gardens. Um, so seed sharing programs, uh, typically, like the most common one you hear about is the seed library. So I don't know if anybody's heard of the seed library, but they've been popping up all over the United States really rapidly in the past couple of years. Um, most of the time they're at um, public libraries and they're just any institution that basically gives away seed for free. And um, it's really great because it allows people to uh, try out growing seeds. It's really good to get people into gardening, get people excited about certain um, issues. Um, so I think that public libraries have really found that it's a fantastic programming tool that they can use. And then other organizations too, like colleges and universities, there's actually a seed library here at Cornell that opened up this year. Um, other churches, other community groups are finding it really helpful to build community, um, to establish a culture of sharing, and all different types of programming opportunities um, that, that seed libraries are really good at establishing. Um, but so far, um, public gardens have been slow to adopt seed libraries or any other type of seed sharing programs, despite the fact that they're a really awesome education tool that they could be using. Um, so in my capstone project, I'm looking at the history of seed libraries, um, what so far has, um, have we seen that works really well or what doesn't, and then seeing how we can tailor this information so that public gardens can use it because there's, there's a significant amount of info out there on how these seed libraries or other seed sharing programs can be established for um, public libraries. But since public gardens have been slow to adopt these programs, I'm looking at how can we make this model adaptable for public gardens. Um, so to do that, I, um, I've researched all different types of seed sharing programs, and then I'm conducting interviews with certain seed libraries or other seed sharing programs that have implications for public gardens. And then I'm going to write a guide that can be used by public gardens to think about what it is they want to accomplish with their seed sharing programs um, and build a program that works really well for them and is really effective. Um, and specifically, I want to look at you know, the specific needs uh, that public gardens have and their specific capabilities and limitations and challenges. And um, by recognizing those things, help them to approach the planning process so that they can implement the seed sharing program that works really well for them. Um, there is a ton of different, one of the most um, interesting things that I think I've found so far is that there's a really wide range of reasons that certain institutions will implement a seed sharing program. It started out as sort of a kickback against the core for control of agriculture and genetic engineering, but it's, and so people wanted to preserve different seed varieties that were going extinct at a rapid rate. But now it's more, a, a lot of different programs are geared to just getting people into gardening, but there's also interest in food justice and um, native plants and conservation. So it can really be a tool for a number of different things. Um, and my guide will help uh, different public gardens assess what they wanna do with the seed sharing programs and then design a program that works to really connect them into their community and be effective. And that's it. <laughs> so are you gonna, it sounded like you were gonna do uh, specific things for specific gardens based on what they want. I'm gonna be, so the guide that I'm gonna write is just gonna sort of outline considerations that public gardens should take when they're in the planning process. Things that they might not have thought of, of the limitations they have, the staffing they have, what type of seeds they should source, because there's a lot of contention around, you know, what type of seeds should we be sourcing? Um, and then it will help them to think through those problems, define what they want to get out of the program. Because like I was mentioning, people, it runs the gamut of people doing seed libraries um, to 
um, push back against corporate agriculture, just to people simply wanting to get people into gardening. And then there's others focused on native plants. So if a help helping a garden to recognize really what it wants to do, and then what are the challenges associated with certain types of programs? How can they plan for that? And how can they best fit their program? Yeah. Thank you. Great. So that's all the talks we have. So um, I would like to thank all of our students who presented today. So I know that there's a lot going on and getting up in front of a group of people and talking about a project that might not be completed yet can be challenging. And so I want to recognize how valuable it was to have you guys do this. I think it was fantastic to see everything that you're doing. And, and I hope I didn't lie when I said we really do have a diverse, ambitious group of students. I think this was pretty awesome. Um, so let's just take a second and just thank everybody. And, and also while we're here, and I know we have a lot of advisors in the room, I'd like to take a moment and just thank all of our advisors for helping us and taking all of this time to guide us through the process of finding these questions and getting these solutions. So let's thank all the advisors. <laughs> And she's busy right now, but let's all thank Tara because everything. This is without Tara, and and uh, all of the presentations being lined up, Zoom being lined up, the lunch being lined up, everything is made possible by what she's done. So let's give her another. <laughs> Um, and so now we have uh, some food, and so uh, I invite you to sit down with somebody who just presented and, and pick their brain and talk to them a little bit. We can use this room for lunch. We can also, it's a beautiful day, we can go outside and enjoy the weather. Um, during the lunch, we also have some posters set up. So as you get done your lunch, you can mingle over there. If you have questions that you didn't get answered or you have ideas, you know, stop by the poster of the person who's presenting and and uh, ask them some questions. So enjoy. Uh, so we only have the one section of presentations. So we'll have lunch and the posters, and then you guys hang out as long as you want, and then we're free to go and we're ready. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.